My name is Sarah Josephine, and I'm the co-founder of Canopy Lab. I think we live in a world today where people are quite fascinated with the role of the entrepreneur. We know that the entrepreneur will play a key part in rebuilding the world after COVID. And I get a lot of emails and, uh, and private messages on social media where people say, you know, how did you build a company? Um, what was it like in the beginning? What made you take the plunge? And what is it like to run a company uh, today that has 40 employees? I think that fascination with the entrepreneur and the lack of female role models made me decide to invite all of you here behind the curtain to explore the story of how Canopy Lab is evolving and how it all started with me. I think I'm what I would call an accidental entrepreneur. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I get a lot of messages from many of you who say, um, I want to be an entrepreneur. I just don't know what my idea is. I don't have an idea yet, but I'm very attracted to the lifestyle. For me, it was quite the opposite. Um, I come from a family that was very poor when I was little. And I think when you live with that sense of insecurity, uh, you do a different kind of life planning. So for me, it was all about stability. And I imagined a very, you know, progressive career, but within established companies that would lead to financial security and just like being happy and not taking a lot of risks. But, um, and I, I mean, and I totally went for that for a long time. But I think just a couple of years after I finished uh, my master's, I realized I really wasn't happy. And I think a lot of young people can resonate with me because I felt that being out there in like the corporate world, I was very much being judged on my age all the time and also on my gender. So I mean that um, when I was a consultant, a lot of projects, I felt like I just didn't get them because you couldn't always give the youngest person the most exciting thing. So I was frustrated with the speed of which my career was evolving. Um, and I also, a lot of times, to be honest, I felt that people who were not as smart and who didn't work as hard got some of the opportunities that I should have had. And it made me want to create my own luck. It made me want to like create my own business. Um, but I wasn't like actively exploring building a business yet because one of the lessons I also learned from working in consultancy is that when you work in consultancy, you work a lot of like on, on different tasks. And I did a lot of cool stuff, like explore the use of prostitutes amongst men in Denmark and whether or not they think about people having been subject to human trafficking. We looked at the privatization of prisons, but ultimately I kind of felt like it was very shallow. And I felt like almost our opinion was for sale, not in the sense that we wrote what was asked of us, but in the sense that politicians will always take a report and spin it in whatever way they feel like. So I knew I wanted to leave the world of consultancy. I had originally wanted to be a diplomat and I had, did a small stint in Russia and I, I didn't like that either. Um, so I decided to go back and start a PhD at Olpo University. And I felt quite blessed that they gave me the opportunity because a lot of times the truth is that PhD positions are filled before they're even posted on the internet. Um, and right around the same time as me launching um, or starting the PhD, uh, I launched Canopy Lab. And I think that they were wildly interconnected. And I think that it's a really different way of starting a company than people who just want to be an entrepreneur. And by that, I don't mean there's something wrong with that. It just, for me, it was, um, I was doing these explorative interviews um, for my PhD with migrants who use social media um, to kind of make their life in Denmark better. So for example, it was interviews with migrants who were being cheated by their employer and then they would crowdsource advice on their contracts and things like that using the internet. And it gave me this very strong sense of something that was happening six years ago with the internet. There was this spike in cyber activism. Um, there was this potential of leveraging big platforms for societal change. But there were also a couple of other things to me that indicated that there was a space where there could be built a business. A lot of the learning software was really bad. Uh, and by here, I mean, um, some of it wasn't in the cloud yet. Um, a lot of it had really bad design. And I felt that my students, so when you do a PhD, you have to also teach. I think I had to teach 300 hours. So I had very close contact with students 
and the using platform, like the learning platforms we're using, they didn't like them. Um, and I think what baffled me is that uh, it kind of felt like you had to have this digital driver's license to use the software. But like by now, you know, I was using WhatsApp and, and uh, Snapchat and all these other things that didn't need a digital driver's license. So the whole time when we were conceptualizing uh, Canopy Lab, we said, how come learning tech sucks and all other techs kind of sexy? Um, won't every industry eventually have to be sexy and have to be user friendly and have to be affordable? So kind of some of the big trends that were out there, you know, I would source them from following other companies and doing my explorative interviews. And then once I got closer to the idea of launching a learning company, I actually launched a YouTube channel because I wanted to make sure I understood the market really well. So I, I launched this YouTube channel and every time I had to teach at uni, and that could be like wildly different things. Uh, I would um, do uh, classes on international relations, uh, diplomacy, relationships between the United States and Russia, but I'd also do classes on like um, uh, qualitative uh, methods and things like that. So every time I had, I would already do that, I would put it up on YouTube and then Rather quickly, we had this community of 5,000 people, which I understand to an influencer today, that's like nothing. But, you know, six years ago, you know, we were some of the first people that were kind of building a community around the classes. And I used that very actively to ask people questions that would support this thesis I had of where we were going with content, where platforms would eventually, you know, spiral towards, uh, why are you here? Are you interested in the community? Do you want to meet other people? Do you care if it's one person talking or does you know the material perform better when it's two people? So it's very explorative and it was very not business oriented in the beginning, but it was just like very deep desire to really understand what's the market, who's the user, and, and is there this room for a service for them? Um, and then I think once all of the research was there, uh, I was quite confident that there was a space to build a business. But I also knew that I wouldn't know how to build it because I'm not a developer. I'm more like the researcher. Um, so I was in a really fortunate position because um, my husband actually knows how to build software, but he owned another company. So once I had all this data and I'd done all these experiments, we're still not a company. I went to him and I said, I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this report. I want you to look at these videos. I want you to look at my work and tell me is there a business here? Do you see something here? And also what would it look like if we wanted to make a new kind of learning platform, something that is more social, something that's more attractive to young people and gives us the ability to capture some of those behaviors and like spirits of the moment. So from the YouTube channel, I saw that a lot of people were becoming friends. So we would have people in like Taiwan and Australia and Portugal that were beginning to talk on other channels and they were beginning to arrange that they were gonna visit each other over the summer. So I felt strongly there was a need for a new kind of learning community that was more social. And I kind of handed over all that research to Chris and said, what is this? Do you wanna help build it? You know, could it be a company? Um, and Chris, he was very dismissive. Um, he said, I just, you know, I have my own company. I am very excited about what I'm building. I'm more a design oriented person. You know, I love things that could go on Pinterest. I'm not sure a learning platform can go that way. I'm not sure the market's ready. Um, but then I noticed that like for the whole weekend, he was really hard to get a hold of. And then actually, so this was a Friday by Monday, he had actually prototyped the entire platform, you know, actually hacking a WordPress that I'm sure many of you know for like your websites and then using some plugins and building some stuff on top of that. And he said, um, I know exactly what you're trying to say with your research. You want to build um, a platform that's a social network that marries a learning platform. And it's going to be a category breaking phenomenon. And there is a market for that. And we're going to build it together. And this is the first version of what it looks like. And, um, and just like that, um, with uh, $45, a weekend of hard work, and uh, eventually a bottle of champagne, we launched the first version of Canopy Lab.